Yeah, it's eight o'clock and we'll just wait for five more minutes and start the session. So meanwhile, I think both our guest presenters, presenters are ready today. So requesting you to tell your friends if possible so that we can start the session in time. And I'll just try to reach the reach Dr. Zanathan. Hi, sir. Good evening. Hello. How are you, sir? Good evening. I think it's good morning I'm... for you. Yes, I'm just. <laughs> so you started your day with a big. Rolling mug, in bed and waking mug. up, as you can probably tell from my. You started uncombed, your day with a big mug of coffee. Hair. You got it. <laughs> so you're the first people I'm seeing. There you go. <laughs> Uh, we'll just wait for two more minutes and start our session, sir. So both our guest presenters today are ready. And Good. Uh, said, uh, did we decide? I think Dr. Kandipan did not present his case last week. So shall we do it next week and finish it off? Or what do we do? Sure. I That's probably good. I, I don't think I can attend next week, but maybe Vera can or... I don't know if you have somebody else that can moderate, but. Okay, I need to check with, uh, like maybe I'll try to check with one of the local ladies if they're yeah. ready to check. So shall we uh, do that and finish it off, sir, next week so that we can wind up? I mean, guest great. presentations yeah. also come to yeah. an end. Yeah. Yeah. There's nobody else waiting to present, eh? No. No. Okay. How are things in Sri Lanka? So this at least you doctors have to or nurses, nursing officers have to answer. They cannot answer on your behalf. <laughs> things in Sri Lanka, doctors. Uh, now again, the COVID situation of cases also gradually increasing. See the, because of the Omicron also reported in our country, there are some travelers from uh, South Africa. So we don't know the other district uh, spread and the sequencing of this COVID virus. Anyhow, the almost all the districts they have sent the sample for the sequencing of this virus. We don't know the extent of spread. Anyhow, you will expecting more cases in near future. That is the situation. <clears throat> yeah so respecting everybody's time sir it's eight five i think we should take off shall we sure sounds good yeah so very good evening one and all i think almost like we have come to a close end of our case presentation schedule as well by next week we'll be completing this is vanilla good evening one and all uh, program coordinator from hyderabad center for palliative care so requesting please all of you, all the participants and the guest presenters to please kindly turn on your video cameras and keep them on throughout the session. Your attendance is very, very important to us. And uh, at the same time, most of you have renamed yourself. So I see still, no, I still see like few cameras are not on. So it'd be nice if all of you can just turn on the cameras and face them. And any time during the presentation, and the time for presentation is 10 minutes, and we have 20 minutes for a discussion. So, and during the presentation or after the presentation, if there is any internet connectivity, please put your 
question in the chat box so that we'll read it out for you and our moderators and the guest presenters will be happy to answer thank you very much and over to you dr prashant please introduce yourself and uh, yes thank you uh, i am dr prashant uh, working as a regional medical officer and can you hear me the voice clear Hello. Yes, sir. Perfect. Please go ahead. Very, very good. And the, can you see the full screen in the project? Yes. Yes. Okay. okay. Thank you. So this is one of the palliative case presentation lung carcinoma. So these are the key question I prepared from this my case. So how to manage a urinary tract infection in the neutrophilic sepsis following the chemotherapy? This is the first question. The second one is to how to optimize the moving dose and the mod while patient develop constipation. The one of the main issue in this complaint from the uh, patient family side also constipation following the morphine treatment. The any possibility of continuing chemotherapy up to five cycle, which already planned by oncology team. There's a initially planned for five cycle, but they have stopped after the second cycle. So I will explain the detail in the case presentation. How to send in the family support to look after him as he wishes. So there are some family conflict after this uh, diagnosis and who is going to look after this patient. So we will discuss later. So this is the patient details. Uh, Mr. A. Balasundaram, so 82 years from uh, Veeravaram Chattilam, is also in the Vaunia district. So the diagnosis is uh, CA lungs, which was diagnosed in uh, 16th of February, the uh, district general hospital Vaunia. So initially patient uh, present to the chest clinic with the chronic cough and loss of appetite and loss of weight for two years. So the serial investigation was done by the chest physician. Then only they found there's a shadow in the X-ray and then for the investigation, then finally patient referred to the oncology team. Uh, in addition to that patient has some blood outflow obstruction, but there is no written document in the uh, clinic book coding, but the uh, patient is uh, finally now in the uh, catheter also. So uh, patient telling there is a surgery waiting for patient, but uh, at the moment because of the COVID-19, <coughs> there is no more routine surgery. So only a few emergencies and these things are going on at the moment. So fast medical history, uh, he has uh, no history of fast medical. So these are some investigation I will focus on because of this uh, case. So chest X-ray, you can see the left upper lobe lesion also, CT contrast also done. And the, sorry, the date was only that 2020, last year, December. So there's a lesion of uh, around uh, four to seven centimeter size. So the huge lesion in the left upper lobe. So lesion also invert upper lobe, pulmonary vein and the mediastinal pulvera and the visceral and the parietal pulvera area. So pericardial invasion also identified in the CT. So there is no destructive lesion in the ribs and the pleural lesion. That is also one of the good sign of this patient. Anyhow, the CT abdomen is normal. Uh, true cut biopsy also sent for the from this patient. Then the final histological finding was the non-small cell carcinoma, the squamous cell carcinoma of the lung. So immune markers also slightly increase in this patient. Lung function test also done, but the result came as very poor testing. So the treatment wise, the uh, five cycle of radiotherapy plan, the, the first cycle was in started for uh, 23rd of February. So following that, the, all the investigation, the blood investigation, serum and all things are normal. Then you have the second uh, chemotherapy also carried out on 17th of March. Uh, following that, the chemotherapy patient develops an upper, sorry, uh, urinary tract infection and neuro, uh, neutrophenic sepsis. So, so patient stayed a uh, few uh, weeks uh, for this uh, complication and then gradually patient discharged from the hospital. Uh, anyhow, that time the, we had a huge uh, COVID uh, situation and the, most of the area lockdown and the issues. So they have the consultant uh, oncologist and the oncology team has planned to stop the uh, uh, chemotherapy because of this issue. So they have started the palliation and the supportive care from uh, June 10th. So radical radiotherapy also not planned because of he has a poor uh, lung function test. Now patient is on character. The pain, sim pain and the symptom uh, and the relevant uh, treatment. So patient has complained cough and dysmia. So pain assessment according to the numeric rating scale. So that was four out of 10. 
So patient already initiated treatment with the oral morphine immediate risk 10 milligrams six hourly. Any of the patient side and the family members also uh, there is a poor uh, compliance due to the constipation. Uh, Dombidone 10 milligram and the lactulose rub 30 ml also started then gradually increasing the frequency. He is a farmer and the wife also healthy and, and 11 children but uh, some alive. Three children died in their early life food, but uh, he also don't remember what is the reason because of the initial lifetime they died. Uh, the family, other uh, children also don't know regarding this uh, incident. So anyhow, one child died due to war and the three children are living in Sri Lanka. Other one, uh, so others are in India and uh, one in Canada also. There is no family history of carcinoma. He started cigarette smoking at his age of 18 years, so almost more than 60 years. He is a chronic smoker for 24 cigarettes. So initial time, there is a BD like uh, cigar and all the things he has smoked. Uh, but in the last two years, he stopped his uh, smoking due to the chronic cough. He is an ex-alcoholic for the last two years. His native place is Vaunia. He is like to live in the village of uh, Virabram. It is in the Chattivulam area, very closer to... Uh, then uh, one of the son is living in this village with his wife. Recently, there was a family issue between him and the son's family. So uh, due to this conflict, the patient is now uh, <coughs> moved to the patient and the wife, his uh, wife. Move to the one of his daughters and president at Kilmerji. That is the situation. Any of the family members also like to bring the patient back to the uh, native place because of he also willing to stay his uh, native place. Then the spiritual concerns the religion is Hindu and he believes in God. And uh, he can able to talk and understand the situation. So there is no issue. The wife also very supportive and the uh, breaking mad news. So uh, not a challenging part in this patient because of one of the daughter is working as a health service assistant. So she also understands the situation, the age and the, the history of chronic so much. So also understand the scenario. So these are the main concern and the, uh, I want to discuss in this group. So the one is the optimize the pain management and the try to get the more in uh, dose of the patient with the severe constipation. Yeah, the, the bowel opening once in 10 days if you are using the morphine. And then the family members told that they have stopped the morphine. Uh, he had no much issue regarding the uh, bowel opening. So that's the main reason the patient uh, poor complaints of this pain management, uh, sorry, this uh, morphine uh, usage. The treatment choice for the constipation management, we have to think about that way also. And the prevent the future UTI while patient is on character. I need a reassessment regarding to restart the hemotherapy or any modification towards the palliative care. So how we can convince his son and his family regarding the father's wish and improve the family support to reduce the psychological burden. These are the things I focus on this case. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. That's helpful things to think about this morning, this evening. Yes. Um, how about the first question? Does anybody have any thoughts about that? How, how to manage severe constipation from opioids and how to talk to the patient and family about this? You mentioned that he was on lactulose. Is that right? Yes, did yes, take yes. Any, did, and he it was is using, regular, that? using lactulose, but anyhow, the uh, complaint is constipation is there. Okay. Um, and he was using it three times a day, you said, eh? The lactulose? Yes, yes. Yeah. Yes. It's pretty frequent. Um, do you have any other oral lactulose? Or anybody have any other laxatives that they would have tried in this situation? Um, do you have any any senicides there? 
Senecot or Senecides? Dalkalax. Okay. Yes, yes. Dalkalax is available. Dalkalax available. Yeah. Yes. Okay. Yes. Dalkalax is available. Um, yeah. Okay. And do you have oral Dalkalax? Oh yes. Oral. Yeah. Okay. Bisacodal. Yeah. Yes. Um. Yeah, that's kind of similar to senicides. Um. So you don't have Senecot or senicides there. Is that right? You don't know what I'm talking about. Okay. Um, it's uh, similar to Dulcolax in that it helps to push the stool along through the bowel. So usually when we think about constipation and laxatives, there's kind of two types of ways that we help constipation. One is to try to keep water in the stool and keep it soft and able to move through the bowel. And then the other one is to encourage peristalsis and the uh, bowels moving the stool through. So lactulose is quite helpful. Um, well, how does, how does lactulose work? Anybody? Why, why does lactulose make you have bowel movements? or loosen stools. We always give it all the time, but. Any thoughts, anybody? Uh... What about Dr. Gunanathan? Any thoughts about lactulose, how it works? Uh, there is a chat uh, from Tuva oh. Rahan saying, can use enema. Yes, you can use enema. Um, how about Dr. Prasanth? How do you know how how does lactulose work? What does it actually do? It is softening the stools. Yeah, so it's an it's an osmotic lactulose. Osmotic, so, yes, osmotic. Yes, yeah, so osmotic. it it pulls the water in. Um, and how does Dulcolax work? Increase the peristalsis more. Yes, yes. Yeah. So increases peristalsis. So, um, so they do work differently, and they certainly can be used together. So, for somebody like him, I think he probably would need to be on both, by the sounds of it. Um, and certainly, we have many patients that do need to be on both a stimulant and an osmotic laxative. It. He sounds like he has pretty severe constipation with opioids, yes. like like more than much more than normal. Yes. Um, so that would be the first thing I would suggest is to try to get him on both of those things. Now the other thought was to try to come from the other end from the rectum uh, with an enema. Did he try any enemas or was he refusing enemas or was he? No, no, they didn't try in any man. Now they frequently uh, omitting the morphine, and then only <laughs> the bowel habit will return. So that's okay. the way the patients are and the family members are doing. So we want to correct that part. Okay. okay. So any of the my other concern is that they have already started the morphine uh, intermediate uh, immediately. So ten milligram uh, six hourly, but the patient pain was not like that. Only. Uh, four out of ten, there is a little bit moderate. So yeah. in this scenario, so uh, shall we start the other non-opioid or weak opioid also? Maybe helpful for this patient. So I am thinking in that way also. So how yeah. Many things? Yeah, I mean, um, things like Tylenol and things can be helpful. And then I think you have tramadol is quite available. Uh, yes. 
yeah. there. So yeah. that may be an option too. And yeah. even even just starting with a lower dose. I mean, he's he is in his 80s. Um, so even just starting with a lower dose of morphine, like 2.5 to 5 milligrams, yes. is very reasonable if he's having yes. kind of mo moderate pain. Um, and uh, 10 milligrams is a fair dose for an 82 year old frail yes. person. So I would think lowering the dose could still give him some benefit and maybe less side effects. And then um, like we talked about having stimulant and an osmotic laxative. And then, um, yeah, from the rectal end, um, things like suppositories or enemas can be quite helpful intermittently if there's, particularly if there's um, impaction or a lot of buildup of stool. And um, so you have Dulcolax suppositories. Yes. What other kind of suppositories or enemas do you have available? So enema we can, available in our country. Okay. The micro enema and... Microlax, okay. Because um, yeah, there's lots of different types of enemas. And some of them are more, again, kind of osmotic based and trying to pull water into the rectum to get the stool to come out. Uh, some of them are more lubrication based, things like mineral oil or glycerin and things like that, where it tries to help to soften the stool a bit, but also um, create less resistance for the stool to come out. And then it can just kind of slide out. And then, um, yeah, some of them are more stimulating to peristalsis. So, um, but the other point that Spithirin is making too, is he on adequate meal intake? So yes. the, and, uh, non, intake. He, was, he was drinking and eating okay? Yes, yes. Yeah. So that is important, um, particularly the, the liquids, uh, making sure people have adequate liquid intake to be able to have enough liquid in the stool. Um, yeah, things like fiber and, and those types of things can be helpful in terms of keeping um, the stool softer. The challenge with that in some cancer patients is that if they do get very constipated or they develop a bowel obstruction or something, then they can cause a lot more cramping and gas and things like that. So we um, usually stick with the other laxatives that are pretty effective. So, <clears throat> so yeah, I think the two main things in that case would be decreasing the morphine dose a little bit and yes. maybe adding an extra, 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 extra laxative. Extra. All right. The next question, how to prevent future UTI while patient is on catheter. Um, oh, we have somebody that raised their hand. It's uh, me. Uh, oh, yeah. Is there any place uh, adding NSAID with, with, with uh, morphine? Yes. I mean, um, yeah, no, that's, that's a thought. We can that's lower the dose of the morphine and uh, add some NSAID so we can relieve some pain. Yeah, the oh, other yeah. the other option is um, lung cancer. Yeah. So it's, it's, he may have a COPD features as well, right? I don't know. What about? Yeah. See, having COPD? No, no. A uh, little bit COPD features also there, but there's no diagnosis regarding the COPD. Okay, so is it okay to give, N I mean, at NSI? Yeah, you certainly can. I mean, I would, in a person in their 80s, I'd probably start with other simpler things like acetaminophen and um and then a lower dose morphine just to see how he tolerates that the other anti-inflammatory to consider in this kind of case would be like a steroid like dexamethasone in, in a kind of low dose even like 
two to four milligrams or something like that. And you could try it for a week and just see if it helps to kind of decrease some of the inflammation around the, the tumor and take some pressure off the, the neural structures and things there. Um, and usually that's pretty, pretty well tolerated at, at, at gentle doses. So um, NSAIDs can be quite helpful. They also have a lot of side effects, obviously in elderly people, um, renal failure and ulcers and things like that. So, um, but no, very, very good thought to add another non-opioid. But um, I think this person probably could tolerate morphine, just needs to be a little bit lower dose and cool. a little bit extra bowel care. So good, good point. Um, how to prevent future UTI while patient is on the catheter. Anybody else have any ideas about that? Prophylactic dose antibiotic. All right. What, uh, that's Dr. Kendeep, and what, uh, what antibiotic would you choose and how would you do that? What about nitrofrantine? Nitrofrantine, yeah. Nitrofrantine. Yeah, that's that's a common one to be used. Um, I don't not sure what your usual practice is there in terms of people on long term catheters, uh, in terms of how frequently the catheter gets changed and those types of things. Is it? Um, every three weeks every three, three weeks. weeks okay yeah. well that's that's good um so yeah obviously why he's on you... catheter any the patient develops some uh urine outflow obstruction but that is not mentioned in the ticket but anyhow we assume that that's the patient already in put the catheter after the chemotherapy treatment so they, they also plan the one surgery, maybe the, the prostate surgery, we don't know the actual thing, but because of the COVID situation, patients also end up with palliation. So they uh, stop that surgery and patient end up with the palliation. So that's a issue. That's a reason the patient is continuously on the catheter. <clears throat> okay. Hmm. Are the, the catheters able to be changed at home or does the patient have to come back to no, the no, hospital? Patient, they, they bring down the patient to, at the moment, that uh, has a yeah. bring down to the hospital, but in the future we can change the catheter if they're home. Yeah, okay. Most probably they move to, again back to their native place uh, because the family split, they want to settle the issues. And so then we can regularly visit there and make arrangements to the catheter change. Okay. And are things like suprapubic catheters ever considered or? That's where the catheter goes kind of just above the pubic bone right into the bladder. Is that everything that's done there? Are you asking the, the pubic catheterization? Yeah, is that ever done in patients there? Or? I didn't see any patient, the palliation no. with the suprapubic. Yeah, maybe some other people can. When we fail a uh, normal catheterization, we may have to go. That's uh, in emergency situations being done. Yes. Uh, huh. So no, we don't know regular practice in palliation. Okay. Yeah, it's it's not necessarily common, and most people can manage with a with a urinary catheter, Foley catheter. Uh, yes. Sometimes. For men in particular, it becomes extremely difficult to insert the catheter, particularly if they're having recurrent changes and they can get some scarring or thickening around the prostate. Um, I mean, obviously for him, it'd be best if you could have some sort of prostate procedure if it was simple enough to tolerate um, to help him to be able to pee. Uh, but if it's becoming extremely difficult to insert a catheter then um, through the penis, then sometimes a suprapubic catheter is considered 
to be done over the longer term for for comfort really because it's easier to change the catheter often than um than with the foley but probably would need to talk to i i don't know if you have a urologist there or somebody else that would be kind of specializing in that area or one a radiologist or something like that to see if they have any experience with that but um okay reflecting antibiotics and catheter changes that would be the main thing there and then number four needs reassessment regarding restarting chemotherapy any modification towards palliative care so you said that his chemotherapy was stopped it was mainly because of covid or because he wasn't tolerating it well so because of mainly covid 19 yeah okay um well, but still, hard... even though some extent the situation is uh, a bit relaxed and the, the oncology team is still continuing the palliation, that's why I am thinking about this uh, benefit to the patient or in balance between the chemotherapy and the palliation. So that's why I am putting this. Mm -hmm. So still the patient has no pulmonary revision or the still the mass the tumor also confined to the lung ends they are slightly inflamed and they invade to the surrounding structures but that's why i am thinking about maybe chemotherapy may helpful low the, the the we have already converted to palliation so some extent we can manage with the chemotherapy or oh, that's a my side worry that's why i put this one mm -hmm. What did the patient seem to want? Was he wanting to continue with chemotherapy or? They are saying there's no obstruction or the, whatever the treatment because of one daughter also, the health staff. So she also understanding the scenario and the situation. But the hospital mm -hmm. preferred anything. So they also happy to follow this uh, treatment. There's no obstruction from their side. Mm -hmm. because of the COVID-19 and the patient need to be admitted for this chemotherapy and need some assessment so that's the thing they have initially stopped but because of the they already planned so they are continuing so that's why I put this one. Mm -hmm. um, does anybody have any thoughts about that? So we still and have was, three more minutes uh, for this presentation. All right. Was there any possibility of radiation in this case, sir? So initially, the radical radiation stopped there, made the conclusion because of low, poor lung function test. Yeah. So that's okay. the patient difficult to tolerate the radiation. That's why the team has already planned to stop the radical radiological treatment. So anyhow. I think the palliative radio also may be impossible because of the patient lung carcinoma. Sorry, the palliative radiation may be possible or? So that's why I'm asking, is it maybe possible? Oh. Because okay. of the poor lung function test, I don't know the patient yeah. tolerate this radiation. Yeah, you'd have to talk to the radiation oncologist. Um, I mean, lung function test is a, continuum of badness so some people feel like it's worth the risk um, yes. for low doses of palliative radiotherapy to try to help control local symptoms and it can be very helpful for pain um, yes. i mean squamous cell carcinoma may be slightly less responsive but still often it's given a try yes. um, so, and that's nice because it's just more of a localized thing rather than causing systemic side effects with chemotherapy. And yeah, in terms of the chemotherapy, I guess that's a conversation with the oncologist and the patient and the hospital and all the else that's going on um, with COVID. It's, it's uh, you're right. It sounds like he's still got localized disease. It's possible he could benefit from it. He's 
a little bit older um, and getting more frail. So the side effects would be potentially more. Um, but uh, yeah, seems like something to, to think about. Is this patient being followed up at Tallipoli? Shobak is asking. No, 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 all the treatments are at Bounty. No, oh, everything's at Bounty. Yes. Okay. The ongoing team also there. So. Okay. And then the last point was to convince. In here, they are referred to the teaching hospital Jaffna, but anyhow, the treatment was started here. The oncology team Jaffna, again, maybe the short period, maybe oncology surgeon, maybe not available on that period. The short period, they referred to the teaching hospital Jaffna, but uh, then all the treatment was done here. Okay. And then your last point was just to convince his son and his family regarding his father's wish and improve family support to reduce psychological burden. When you say his father's wish, what do you mean yes, by that? Yes, uh, because of his uh, native place is Aounia, uh, so the problem is initially the son and father all are living together, and uh, after the marriage of son, there are some family split between the son's family and the father. So due to this reason, uh, the, uh, this patient and the, his wife moved to Klinochi, another uh, daughter's son was there. So the, but the other family members also tried to bring the patient back to his uh, native place. Oh, so I see. Okay. That type of, I think the next couple of weeks time, so they will sort out this issue. So this is a temporary issues and the patient is also suffering because of, he want to stay there native place. So <laughs> that's a, uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Because he's a farmer and living long period for that place, and uh, he also is satisfied with that. Uh, okay. Stay in there, but yeah. Well, thank you very much for that case. That's thank you, thank you. that's good. We should probably move on to the next one here, just yeah. given the time. So I hereby request uh, Miss Vijay uh, Nathan uh, from like the nursing officer to please introduce yourself and uh, start the presentation. I'll be sharing the slides for you, madam. So you just have to tell next slide and I'll change it for you. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Would you please introduce yourself? <clears throat> I am Mrs. Vijayala Gunanadan, nursing officer, District General Hospital, Mulativ. Good morning and good evening, all of you. Next slide, please, madam. Concentrated parts of case presentations today, uh, multidisciplinary approach, social service assistance, further clinical management and family counseling, palliative care to the baby. Next slide, please. Age 11 years, a male child, diagnosed and aid, epileptic encephalopathy, 2004 in Antarathapra Hospital. Other diagnosis, uh, microcephalic and global development delay. Next slide, please, ma'am. Treatment and significant investigations, uh, full blood count, last vote admission, uh, baby admitted was uh, high fever, uh, WGBC also 11.89, uh, HP 12.2 gram per deciliter, platelet 27,000, CRP 11.9. Uh, previously done uh, echocardiograph, uh, normal heart, USS abdomen and KUB, normal. EEG uh, done by neurologist at uh, Andradapura Hospital, multifocal spike seen, frequent spike and slow wave activity. Encephalopathic with multifocal epileptic form, discharges seen. Uh, EEG done on 2020. Uh, blood culture and urine culture, no growth. Uh, last uh, vote admission. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Treatment and significant investigations. Uh, oral penitine, uh, 50 milligram. Oral sodium valparate, 300 milligram. Oral clobasum, 10 milligram. Oral tropramate, uh, 100 milligram. Oral diazepam, 5 milligram. Oral melatonin, 3 milligram. Omiprazole 10 milligram, famotidine 10 milligram. Next slide, please, ma'am. Uh, continue drugs, oral benzexol 4 milligram, 
oral sindopa half tablet oral pyroxamine 100 mg oral cal calcium carbonate half tablet uh, folic acid and oral prednisolone also uh, last vote, last vote admission baby had a high fever so uh, started iv in injection cefotaxim 1 gram 6 hourly and injection piperacillin 1.9 gram uh, iv 6 hourly uh, baby had uh, 10 to 15 feet attacks per day. So, uh, teaching hospital and other neurology started injection methyl prednisolone 630 milligram IV daily, five days uh, per month. Baby still on IV injection methyl prednisolone uh, pulse therapy. Next slide, please. Na. Past medical history, antenatal history, regular clinic follow-up and antenatal medications, folic acid taken uh, three months before pregnancy, all antenatal scans normal. Intranatal history, emergency LSES, uh, failed induction. Next slide, please. Postnatal history, birth weight also normal, 3.2 kilogram. No uh, special baby care unit admission. Uh, once um, fever spike is there. Next slide, please. <clears throat> Holistic assessment and psychological and family concern. Uh, father, 45 years, and mother, 38 days. Uh, 11, two children, one 11 years, these children, and another one, five years. Arranged marriage, uh, mom is in 10th grade, father is in 9th grade. Uh, now, father and mother uh, separated. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, spiritual concern, all are Muslims. Family members believe in hope. God. Next slide, please. Communication, Tamil language speaking family. Father and mother separated due to uh, this baby's disease condition. Uh, this baby uh, developing fits uh, per day 15 to 20 times daily. So mother um, ignore this baby and uh, separated from family. Uh, baby can sit and uh, can sit without support. Uh, baby can't walk or talk, only shouting and laughing. Baby is very active. Next slide, please. Um, policy assessment, uh, collaboration and partnership. Speech therapy is not follow up uh, now. Specialist is not follow up. Nursing care, baby is on pet tube. Uh, baby father is carrying the baby. Uh, she won't. Uh, baby want uh, perineal care. Father is only father uh, care the child. Next slide, please. Family support and social support. Father and the child stay with grandmother. Uh, mother separated and staying with another child at uh, grandma's home. Grandmother stay with for uh, them uh, for uh, help. She is 80, 80 years old. Sibling bond and care is not satisfied. Uh, um, uh, another child stay with mother. This baby never had mother's love. Mother is ignores this child. Uh, father is spending all time to care the baby. Uh, father, they receive uh, 8,000 from DS office and 3,000 from disability center, only uh, her income. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, main concern from this uh, case study, what you want to discuss with group? Uh, I think prognosis, extended support of speech therapy and continuous pediatric follow-up and methyl prednisolone pulse therapy. Uh, psychological support to the father. Uh, consider about ketogenic diet. This baby uh, maintaining her symptomatic uh, treatment one of a ketogenic diet. Uh, he is on now pet tube. Uh, father is uh, know very well. Um, ketogenic diet uh, only uh, taking ketogenic diet. Uh, um, this is the my case study. Uh, thank you very much. Wow, thank you very much. That's um, a lot to work through there for that family. Very, very difficult situation. Um, 
Uh, just to say that I don't work a lot in pediatrics myself, so I'll be interested in those that do in terms of their their experience. I have some experience with pediatrics, but um, yeah, lots of psychosocial and family issues here in addition to the significant medical issues. Um, so this, this child is 11 years old, is that right? I'm just trying to yes. clarify that they're yeah, um, and when when did the parents separate? Uh, this baby's uh, frequent hospital admission um, since the three years of this baby. Since three years old, okay. Yes. So the parents separated around the age of three. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Um, and currently you said the child can sit without support, but not walk? Can, sub, uh, can sit without support, can't yeah. walk. Okay. And, and they can talk some? Uh, only shouting. Only shouting, oh. but not, not real can't words. Talk. Yeah. Okay. Only voices and shouting. Okay. Laughing very well. Yeah. Um, and when they have seizures now, like how often do they, does the child have seizures now? Yes. Like every, uh, every day, day or? Eight to, eight to 10 times. Eight to uh, 10 times. Yeah, per day. And, and what do they, how do they manage those seizures now? Uh, short lasting, around one minute or two minutes. Okay, so it's just very short. So they just resolve on their own. Yes, baby okay. can manage. Maybe they can manage. Okay. Um, okay. That's, yeah, very difficult. Anybody have any uh, other questions or thoughts about that case? Is this a common situation you might see or in your practice? in Northern province or Eastern province where you work? Anybody? Have other people encountered other cases like this or? Silence. How, how many? How many of you work in in pediatrics as well as with adults? Is that normal, or is it usually more pediatric specific? Sorry, I didn't get you. Oh, how how many of you also work in pediatrics? Is it? Do you work mostly with adults if you work with adults or do you often work with adults and children? So we have a separate wards. So in a uh, primary care setup, we do have to see the patient in the <coughs> outpatient department. So we have to see all the patient. But all in the, the patients. Yeah, in the ward setup, uh, we have a pediatric MOS and uh, uh, medical okay. MOS. So it is separate. So okay. Out, out okay. setup, it is some. Yeah. But you do see both. Okay. So um, I was most. I was worked a short period in the neurology department during after my post in there. So these type of patient, the neurology very difficult to treat, and most probably they were already started several epileptic drugs. So then difficult to try to treat the drugs because of they are started drugs. So. Yeah, patient sometimes end up with some status, epileptic status, or patient end up with ICU care. Then only we can think about the restarting the regime. Otherwise, uh, difficult to control the seizure. That's the main issue of this child. So that type of thing also there. Anyhow, mm -hmm. the chronic thing is there, but the repeated seizure in every day with the frequent episodes, so that is also very disaster to the family. Difficult to keep the child and uh, monitor. Yeah. 
Um, the first question was around prognosis. Dr. Kandipan says, I think bad prognosis. Can you <coughs> elaborate on that anymore? Do you have any thoughts on what prognosis might be in this case? Or? I think because of the uh, lot of uh, anti-epilatory drugs, even yeah. with the drugs, it's a developing seizure. And uh, for a day, five to six times seizures means there's a brain damage. Most probably there's a brain damage chances. Yeah. And the developmental delay also there. It's a global developmental delay also there. And uh, now it's a pay, uh, that child is can't able to speak and can't stay uh, stand at the age of 11. So yeah. I think most of the things are not favor in good progress. Yeah. It's, um, it's, it's important to think about to the things that might be life ending for this patient. So like, I mean, they have made it to 11 years old, which is, is, you know, several years. Um, it seems like they're tolerating their diet. Okay. Are, are they having any issues with like recurrent pneumonias or anything like that? Or Were they, were they having any issues with recurrent infections or recurrent pneumonias? Do we still have Vigicala there? There we go. Um, Hyderabad Center say most of the times in this diagnosis, we see the size of the head growing bigger and bigger, and it looks scary for the parents. Has that been an issue at all in this case? Uh, Miss Vijayanathan, are you there? Yes, yeah. Is that um, has that been an issue at all in this case with the head growing very large? Yeah. Has, has been, clear, what's that? Question is not clear. Oh. Has that been an issue at all with the head growing very large in this case? Uh, okay, maybe I'll turn off my video. To understand. Um, maybe can maybe someone it's translate it in Tamil? Blengile. Thalavandi perisari in Tamari? Illa, sir. Microcephaly. Microcephaly, yeah. Microcephaly. Okay. okay. Um, that makes sense. And Vijikala, has there been recurrent infections for this patient? Like, do they have recurrent pneumonias or other infections? Uh, no, sir. No, they're doing okay there. Last, last uh, month also, uh, he had a um, high fever. Yeah. Otherwise, no infection. Okay. Because I, yeah, it, I would find it extremely difficult to prognosticate in this situation. I mean, obviously, there's many challenges and overall the prognosis would be poor. But I mean, certainly, it seems like it could still have years to live. Um, if they've been managing okay, up until now, and there's no really in, recurrent infections would be or, or difficulty tolerating feeds. Um, like if they really were having a lot of vomiting or something or not tolerating the peg tube, then those would be other 
four signs, but it is, it's hard to know exactly how long they may have, um, which makes it difficult for the father and the family to plan. Um, in terms of, of ongoing support to the family, does anybody have any thoughts about ways that we could help to support the family and the father in this? I think they are getting the financial support from the government. Uh, psychological support, uh, I don't think he can provide. So we have to find some social work also, something like hospice care should be the ideal for this patient. But yeah. in our area, it is not available at the moment. Uh, maybe they can can be directed to the hospice in the Tedlipala. I don't know. That is, yeah. Uh, yeah, in some places they have hospices that provide it's called respite care, where, you know, it's not that we think that this patient is necessarily imminently at the end of their life, but it's um, to really help the father to have some time to rest so that they don't have to be looking after the child so intensely all the time. Um, so yeah, Dr. Vithuran says some sort of relaxation for the father. So just to give even like a week or two weeks or a few days or whatever it may be to um, help the father to have a, a break from some of this intense work that he's called to. Um, so that can be, that can be very helpful. I think, you know, encouraging the father, it sounds like he's doing all that he possibly can and he's quite knowledgeable about the situation as much as he can within his own um, education. Um, so sometimes encouragement from the healthcare team that, that parents are doing all that they possibly can uh, is quite helpful because I think when you're in these situations as a parent, you really do wonder if you're doing a good job and you can certainly doubt, doubt yourself. Um, so that can be encouraging. Um, but yeah, we have very... homes where disabled patients, I mean, uh, kids are being looked after. Okay. Uh, I don't know uh, whether they can accommodate that. So uh, I don't know, Miss. I don't know the. Yeah. So is there any possibilities? I mean, who's that? Uh, who presented? Yes, Doctor. Where? No. Vijay Karla. Oh, Vijay Nitna Nade. Oh, oh, home and the uh, disabled player park or home is the Nanga. Where did come on? A park with Pamilla, Tan, Tan, and the play with the park on Monday, remember. But every month, hospital admission, uh, five days or six, seven days sometimes. Uh, Mittel Pitness alone, IV, pulse therapy, Kanga, Padala Vandaver, hospital, Pakatalan, Hikinam, Padala Vandaver, Poku, Tulila. Easy, I come up the country spend but not the money spending less than the car. Income DS office Lago Kuram at the disabled and Kurukurakasam relations Mandu the Vitayana. The Sodatia Pizza Raglam with a medical care for Ragal. Twenty times. ஒருத்தன் <laughs> 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 Uh, yeah, the, I, I just asked about the home care. I mean, uh, we have uh, disabled pe uh, people ho homes. Yeah. And they said uh, uh, the father is not 
happy to uh, be and uh, the house is uh, nearby the hospital so okay. further the homes also not uh, taking over this kind of patient because they have to be at uh, the patient need to be admitted frequently to the hospital that's why the homes also not happy so but the, the another one there is a question um, can we keep this patient in the sedation uh, because uh, as he is getting the frequent fits fit. so that is the question from the audience ah uh, can we keep the patient sedated like continuously yeah 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 what do people think about that? Is that a good idea to sedate them continuously to try to prevent seizures? Yeah, that's what, uh, that, that's a question. Just so we wanted to get you a idea. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, I would not think that would be a good idea because it the, the patient does not seem to be kind of imminently dying. Uh, so usually when we think about like palliative sedation, say for refractory seizures, it's more in the context of imminent end of life. So people that are in the last, you know, hours to few days to maybe short weeks of life, this patient seems like they're chronically very unwell and having seizures. So sedating them continuously, um, yeah, I would not think would be a normal, a normal thing. Um, I mean, it might be, there might be other anti-epileptics or like increasing some of the doses of the current anti-epileptics that may make the patient more drowsy or sleepy for longer periods of time, um, which may be kind of an acceptable side effect trade-off. Um, but I think like intentionally deeply sedating the patient continuously would not be, not be ethical from my perspective, but people can argue many different things. So, um, anybody have any different ideas? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I guess the, the other question is like, if, if it seems like the child is suffering a lot and, and these ongoing hospitalizations are not really improving their quality of life and really just prolonging their suffering, certainly they may come to a place where the father would be wanting to really just only be providing comfort care to the patient and allowing natural progression and death. Um, and if that's the case, then, and they're having ongoing refractory seizures and things like that, then sedation may be more appropriate. Um, but, and, and then doing things like, you know, these pulse steroids and IV antibiotics and ICU admissions and those types of things would not be in keeping with that. But it sounds like the current goals are very much to still support ongoing um, length of life as, as much as that is possible and managing the seizures as best as possible. So very, very heavy, complicated case. Um, thank you very much for presenting that. That's very good to have a pediatric case. And this is an extremely common type of case in pediatric palliative care. It's uh, um, refractory seizures in patients with developmental delay. It's an extremely common challenge. So good to review it some. Thank you, sir. Okay, Thank well, you. thanks to both of our presenters and for people interacting some today, that was great. I think we'll aim to have one last case discussion uh, next week, just to wrap up our last cases. We'll try to see if Dr. Vera is around to be able to help 
uh, facilitate some of that. And I know it's always very helpful to have him around as well, given that he speaks Tamil and that is a much more dynamic language to interact in. So I apologize for not being up on my Tamil. Um, but uh, that would be our, our last case discussion, I think, as part of this course. And then probably moving into the, the new year, we can try to be having some ongoing discussions uh, about the cases you're seeing as you're starting um, your practice in different districts and then kind of rotating through the different districts to, to get a sense of what's going on. In the meantime, if you have questions that come up in cases that you're seeing in your practice, please, please post questions to the, the WhatsApp group and we can try to have some discussion on there as a group. And uh, there's many faculty that are on the group and we can try to help provide some suggestions as well. So that's a great resource to you to, to be using if needed. Um, and then one last thing is we're just uh, finishing the um, kind of post course take home quiz that we'll email out to all of you um, that have participated on a regular basis. And it's a take home open book kind of uh, more learning review quiz just to kind of go through some of the main topics that we've talked about and you can answer the questions as best as possible. And it's more of a, of a learning exercise um, to consolidate your learning. It's not marked per se, but we encourage you to, to um, complete it as, as best as possible. And then you can submit it back to Vanilla and that will go towards the criteria for receiving your certificate at the end of the course. So. We'll get that out to you probably within the next week or so here. Um, okay. Does anybody have any other questions or anything today? Okay. Well, nice to see you all again. I apologize for my bad hairdo here out of, out of bed, but um, good morning and good evening. And uh, we'll see you some time in the future. Your day started and we have come to end of our day. Okay. So. <laughs> have a good sleep. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zanathan. Like that's a wonderful uh, discussion. And I should really thank both Dr. Prashant and uh, uh, Ms. Vijikala uh, Nathan for uh, presenting wonderful, wonderful cases. And, uh, and we, I think we had a very good discussion this week. Thanks a lot. I think one case presentation uh, is stuck up, which we couldn't do it last week. So Dr. Kandipan, so shall we uh, do it uh, next week? Uh, because it's December 15th uh, and you will be the only one person who will be presenting this next week. So shall we uh, schedule it for 15th December as it's Wednesday? Hello? Dr. Kandipan, I think he's not here. So maybe I'll just, I have his number. So I'll just text him and uh, confirm whether he's ready to present his case or not, sir. Depending upon that, I'll be sharing the schedule uh, with everyone. So I have shared the feedback link in the uh, chat box, please uh, requesting all of you. I know it's it's late, we are late mm -hmm. by 10 minutes, but it just takes one minute to fill up the feedback link. And it's very, very important to us. So if everything goes well, we'll be seeing you next Wednesday, 8 p.m., December 15th. Thank you so much. Very good evening and good night and very good morning. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Good night.